The Senate will come to order. Please stand for the prayer. Today's chaplain is our Senate chaplain, Pastor Mike Smith from Redeeming Love Church in Maplewood. And following the prayer, please remain standing for the Pledge of Allegiance. Good morning, Senators. I, I do want to tell you that if I look a little tired, I had a late night last night. I didn't get to bed till 10 p.m., so I... <laughs> Let's pray. I want to begin with reading from Isaiah 43. But now this is what the Lord says. He who created you, he who formed you, do not fear, for I've redeemed you, I've summoned you by name, and you are mine. And when you pass through the waters, I will be with you, and when you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. <clears throat> When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned, and the flames will not set you ablaze. For I am the Lord your God. I'm the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. So forget the former things. Do not dwell in the past. See, I'm going to do a new thing, and now it springs up, and you do, do you not perceive it? I'm making a way in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland. I am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake, and I remember your sins no more. I believe in the power of prayer. It's more than a concept, but it's a reality in its effect. And I believe in the power of blessing. So I just pray blessing over all of you today. Sometimes when the challenges and struggles in life seem overwhelming, may you know that whatever you are going through, may you know that God is merciful. May you know that God is forgiving and may you know that he is your strength and a very present help in times of struggle. May you know that God longs to be your peace. And then at times when we feel over our heads, may we lift up our heads and trust in him. And may you know that he is with us. He knows you by name. He will never leave you or forsake you. I pray that you never give up on your dreams and may you never stop hoping. May you never stop searching for new horizons with renewed ex expectation. And most of all, may we never forget God. I pray that especially in times when we are tired, and it would be this morning, in those times when we are frustrated, may we strive to be forgiving and merciful, filled with humility, with a desire for unity. And I'm convinced completely convinced that God wants to bless you. And may this year, because of your sacrifice, because of your commitment to our wonderful state, I pray that this would be a season of fulfilled promises. I pray for endurance. I pray that there would be breakthroughs in your life. I pray that there would be vision and plans fulfilled. May there be increase in your life and fruitfulness and fulfillment. So, Lord, bless all who make government possible in Minnesota. Bless our governor. Bless our representatives. And bless these senators and staff and all of their families. And, Lord, from Baudette to Blue Earth and from Pine City to Pipestone, we declare, God, that you will bless Minnesota. Amen. Secretary will take the roll. Senators Abler, Anderson, Bach, Benson, Bigham, Carlson, Chamberlain, Champion, Clausen, Coleman, Swazinski, Dames, Dibble, Dornick, Dreheim, Duckworth, Dietzik, Eaton, Eichhorn, Eakin, Fate, Friends and Friends, Gazelka, Goggin, Herr, Hoffman, Housley, Howe, Ingebrigtsen, Isaacson, Jasinski, Johnson, Johnson, Stewart, Kent, Kiffmeyer, Klein, Coran, Kunish, Lang, Latz, Limmer, Marty, Matthews, McEwen, Miller, Murphy, Nelson, Newman, Newton, Osmick, Pappas, Port, Pratt, 
Putnam, Rarick, Rest, Rosen, Rood, Senjum, Thomasoni, Torres Ray, Utke, Weber, Westrum, Uyghur, Wickland. Pursuant to Rule 14.1, the following members intend to vote under Rule 40.7. Senators Bigham, Carlson, Champion, Coleman, Dietzik, Eaton, Eakin, Goggin, Lane, Latz, Murphy, Newton, Thomasoni, and Torres Ray. A quorum is present. We will begin today with motions and resolutions. Senator Gazelka. Senator Gazelka, you should have a motion to uh, take House File 2 from the table. Uh, Mr. President, I do have that. Um, just some brief comments about last night. First, um, I, th I think we passed, because it was so late, I just want to say the public safety bill uh, there's a lot of really, really good stuff in that. Many people, both sides of the aisle, House, Senate, uh, really did, uh, I think, exceptional work for a bill that was extremely difficult to get done. And so I just want to thank everybody that was involved in that work, both sides of the aisle, House included. Um, we can, anybody can point to a lot of good things in there and, and be proud of the work that uh, the House and Senate did, and so I'm, I'm, I'm certain the governor will sign it, but uh, nice job for everyone there. Uh, mis uh, Mr. President, I move that House File Number 2 be taken from the table. On that motion, all in favor, say aye. aye. Opposed, say no. Motion prevails. <laughs> Senator Gazelka. Mr. President, pursuant to Rule 26, I designate the House File Number 2 be made for special orders for immediate consideration. Members, the bill up for consideration is House File 2, Senator Chamberlain. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, members. I'm hoping this won't take long today. Um, so House File 2 is our agreed to K-12 bill. Uh, it, it's, I'm going to use a little uh, one word, kind of an acronym to describe it. Simple. Uh, it's money, not mandates. Basically simple. So beginning of the session, we had an idea and a goal, and that idea and goal was simple. And it was an acronym, it uh, meant student-focused, innovation, mandate-free, parent involvement, literacy-driven, and efficient. Now, we achieved most of those goals here in the Senate. Well, to be sure, some things were lost, but it's simple. Both the House and the Senate had many provisions in their bills, of course, and uh, uh, compromise, of course, necessitates a lot of those things being put aside to get to a compromise and an agreement in the end. And what you find in the legislation is simply uh, a compromise, and all of it was bipartisan, and most of those items and uh, provisions were heard both in the House and the Senate. Now, to be honest, obviously, from my perspective, the people lost, or had to give up quite a bit to get here. But nonetheless, what we have in front of you is a simple bill, money, not mandates. Again, most of these provisions are bipartisan, and I'm going to, <laughs> this is gonna be quick, members, I'm just going to highlight a few pieces of that. Some of the provisions. Of course, what we have is a formula. The formula is the largest increase in 15 years. Largest increase in 15 years. We ended up at two and a half and two. During the negotiations, we uh, came to the conclusion that we got to go simple and money, not mandates. That is what the schools and districts are asking for. And we pushed to three and one and a half. In the end, we ended up with two and a half and two. Still the largest formula increase in 15 years. That's $296 per pupil members, $1.1 billion over four years, $1.1 billion over four years, just about a 6% increase overall for the two years, 6% over two years. So not too bad. In addition to that, we had very few mandates. There are some mandates in the policy, 
but for the most part, they are what we would call soft mandates, not brand new, things that schools were already doing, or they advised they could do it. So what that does, members, is that amplifies the, the, the power of that formula increase. The, from ex using that money to uh, pay new expenses due to new mandates, now that money is theirs to use. It's local control, members, that formula some may have problems with it, but it's still, right now, at this time, the fairest way to uh, spend that money as best they can. And it gives local control. So on to some of the other provisions. Teachers of color, another uh, major uh, priority for the session for both the governor, the Senate, and the House. There are a few differences between the Senate, the governor, and the House's positions, and those were ironed out. That's about $35 million over four years, a significant increase to increase the number of teachers of color in the classroom. I will not go through all those provisions, but uh, there are several pieces to it. And if you have a question, I will certainly be happy to answer it. You can see it on your change sheet. There's several different items listed under the teacher's component, teacher's area. ELL cross-subsidy, four years of that. Uh, four millions for each biennium. That was something that the governor and the House had requested. Special ed cross subsidy, not a whole lot, but something the House and the governor had asked for at 10 million one time for 22-23. The big addition from our original bill was an ask from the governor and the House for VPK. So that is extended for two years. A couple of new things that we should be very proud of, members, and that we have been working on for years, is literacy. Simple, basic, common sense literacy. So we have a program we have finally funded, not as much as we had wanted originally, but $3 million to help teachers catch up. They uh, were shortchanged in college. The teachers want this. This is a bipartisan uh, uh, proposal that has been developed over the last two years. That's letters. Math car, a house provision. And mental health, it's been a big issue before the pandemic. It became a greater issue during the pandemic. So we're doing a couple of things to address that. One, the kids got back in school, that helped. Number two, funding a uh, suicide prevention training for teachers in schools. But I think also, most importantly, members, is something brand new. And there's two components to it. Social media, screen time, digital well-being. Senator Swadinski had a provision about limiting screen time to children, and I believe uh, uh, Senator Swadinski was children in preschool. You can nod at that, it's okay. Yeah, it was preschool. Limiting screen time to kids in preschool, which makes great sense. The second part of that is digital well-being grants to a nonprofit in the state of Minnesota to start addressing the terrible challenge and the uh, problems that social media has caused and in, uh, for our children. The impact it has on the kids, the students, and the educators have quite often said that that is the number one problem they're facing in a lot of their classrooms, distracted kids and screen time. So we uh, should look forward to great things from that organization to address that problem. Finally, we have a thing in there, Senator Champion wanted girls in action. I, uh, uh, good idea, community, uh, to get at students of color to help enhance their abilities and give them greater opportunities. So members, that's it. Big increases in spending, no few mandates, so a couple new initiatives and focusing on priorities like literacy and mental health. So members, um, that's what we have. I'm, of course, here for all your questions. Thank you. Discussion on House File 2, Senator Weger. Thank you, Mr. President. I offer the A100 delete all. Uh, just kidding. Uh, you know, we support the bill enthusiastically, and uh, there's no amendments at the desk, and I want it to stay that way. I will wait till third reading to elaborate further. Thank you. Further discussion on the bill? 
Seeing none, the Secretary will give House File 2 its third reading. House File Number 2, a bill for an act relating to education finance, providing funding for pre-kindergarten through grade 12 education. Third reading. Final discussion on the bill. Senator Weger. Thank you, Mr. President. We strongly support the compromise that's been developed. And yes, it hasn't been a transparent process, but finally we're at the finish line, and it's going to provide needed help. It's not a panacea for full school funding that is really needed, but it's going to help stop the bleeding in many districts, and that's a great thing. I know Senator Chamberlain will acknowledge staff in closing remarks, but in this opportunity now, I want to as well. We have an amazing nonpartisan research staff. Anne Marie Lewis has been with us 25 years, legal counsel, Jenna Hofer back here, uh, fiscal analyst, Betsy Helseth, research analyst. What an incredible dedicated team, and like so many of the others, they have not had a day off. They've been on call since we gaveled the regular session. We so much appreciate your nonpartisan dedication, super erogatory efforts. To also Cassie McGinnis, the reviser, the amendments, the changes that we're always offering. There's people with families and other parts of their life, and they're always available for us, and we so much appreciate that. To Judy Donovan, the, the committee uh, legislative assistant, all-purpose uh, professional, uh, thanks for keeping us informed uh, as needed. Thank you to Greg Marcus, the committee administrator, to researcher Ed Cook, and finally, to our researcher, Donna Elling, who has been with us as well, uh, 25 or more years with service in the House. You all, you're amazing, and we deeply appreciate all of your efforts, and to all the LAs and others that have been a part of this as well. Yes, this is a significant investment, the most in 15 years. and. It's very appropriate to acknowledge where we should give a lot of the thanks to, and that would be to Governor Tim Walls and to the House Democratic leadership. If we're talking about the resources and keeping it simple and the money and the formula that came, that was lifted up from the zero formula we had earlier, to where we can have agreement now. Because there's many parts of this that you wouldn't recognize from the earlier version. Points that we strongly pointed out when the bill was up earlier. It has dramatically improved. And we're at 554 million or so in spending. Actually, the House Democrats, the governor, after the supplemental information came out, they were at 700 million, and would have, and they provided the resources. But hey, let's you know, we'll put up 67 votes. I hope that we got this far. But remember, we were at zero, nada on the formula, and now there's 450, 60 million. We know how that target got lifted, and that needs to be acknowledged. Also, the importance of voluntary pre-K-4. 4,000 students needing some extra help and a high-quality program. The bill we passed earlier over the objection of the Senate Democrats had nothing for voluntary pre-K-4. 4,000 students, and we say we want to close the opportunity gap. We all do, but a proven way of doing that is providing high-quality services, especially 
for the kiddos that need that extra help so they're ready for K, et cetera. This will provide it. The four, and this was a high priority by Governor Walls, by the House Democrats, and it's in here. And we're so thankful. It's just for two years, we'll be back to fight for more, but it's in here, and we all agree, and that's a good thing. And a bipartisan provision, and I want to thank Senator Abler for the, being chief author for the Teachers of Color, American Indian teachers that we need to increase bipartisan support, and thank you for asking me, and especially thank you for asking Senator Kunish, who championed this as a House member. And for those of us that have been here a while, let's think about Senator Torres Ray, who's carried this for several years and has said we need to do this, and now in a bipartisan way, it's going to happen. It's overdue, but it's going to happen, and the results will come in bit by bit as we recruit students in high school, encourage them, as we provide paths for persons and grow your own program, hiring bonuses, et cetera. It's exciting. It's transformational, bipartisan support. So let's all be proud that it came together and that it's funded. And other initiatives related to our common objective on closing the achievement gap for the Sine Foundation. Tony Sine, what a wonderful person who's dedicated, uh, after being an international soccer star, to being a, leading a foundation committed to helping students with programs to provide hope, opportunity to graduate, and Three million, I believe, was included in a bipartisan way. Uh, that is great news. This is going to help a lot of students. Several other items with bipartisan support. The cross-subsidy in special education, $10 million. That's important. Every school board member will tell you about that. The English language learners. $2 million a year to help address that in the cross-subsidy. And the letters program. Yes, let's do that. It's evidence-based, science-based, and if that is going to help teachers, we're all for it because we need to lift up that key indicator at third grade on reading proficiency. And if you're at risk there, it really puts you at risk for graduating and further complications in life. So third grade reading, and if it gets into the letters program and it's going to help, that's great. Mental health, pre-COVID was a big issue in our state. It still is. And we appreciate the focus, in part, on the bill for digital wellness and the Live More, Screen Less program. I look forward to their development of programs, developing a hub of resources, of involving students. Senator Swidinski's initiative that Senator Chamberlain mentioned as well, it ties in. The Girls in Action program, and I think uh, Senator Champion for uh, an advocate, uh, advocating it and for it being included, I believe this program, which will now be available to many girls, in the area, uh, but it started actually at uh, North High several years ago, and to provide role modeling, mentoring, and uh, a path of hope for girls. And it's proven, and here's additional money. These are good things. These help close that opportunity gap. There's other items. Uh, one that I, I want to mention, too, is the inclusionary, uh, non-exclusionary discipline training. We need students to stay in school. And if there's been some uh, issues regarding uh, behavior not up to code, uh, we need to develop better strategies in addressing it. There's a million or so dollars. That's very important uh, for this type of training. We advocated, and it was $50,000 a year for the Bloomington Museum. It didn't make it, 
before, but it did this time. All museums serve a very important educational role. And uh, thank you, Senator Rosen, earlier for including the Mankato, but Bloomington, the Grand Rapids, all museums are important, and we had argued for it. Some policies with a bipartisan support, the prohibition on meal shaming. Uh, it's, been, it's taken a while to get this done. Uh, thank you, Senator Housley, for carrying the bill this year, getting it to the finish line. Uh, Senator Kent, for your efforts for many years. Former Senator Alice Johnson, and many of these, it's taken a while. Let's remember how it actually got to where it's on the cusp of becoming law, but prohibiting meal shaming needs to be enacted, and it will be. The religious observance of holiday, a policy notice, and uh, I guess we could call this a friendly uh, mandate, uh, but this was one of Senator Fate's first initiatives, and it's included. In fact, I think it's the first thing when you look at the bill that you'll see. And uh, I thought that during the hearing, uh, how uh, good, interesting it was when uh, one of the first testifiers was Senator Chamberlain's uh, a pastor at one of his churches, but it was a good connection and bipartisan support. The limits on screen time has been mentioned, and thank you, Senator Swedensky for pointing out the importance of putting some rest further restrictions. And how many of us are looking at screens now, always, and then we might wonder <laughs> about younger kids, so you know, maybe we can role model that better, too. And I also I want to thank Senator Chamberlain for including a bipartisan provision which provides a notice to parents, staff, and students if there's an environmental hazard that's been cited at a school. And the background on this related to water gremlin in our districts, Senator Chamberlain, Senator Isaacson, and myself. And now this will become a statewide uh, requirement in terms of notice. Uh, there are provisions that didn't make it. That's the case for all omnibus bills. There were ones that uh, we are pleased that didn't make it. And I'll just announce that the voucher proposal, and some may not refer to it, but we did not advocate for the education savings account because it could, according to nonpartisan research, take out 250 million by 2025 that funds that could go for education. We joined the state's largest parent organization, the Minnesota PTA, and their 200 plus chapters in opposing we must fully fund our schools and not siphon money that's going to hurt their ability to accomplish the objectives that we've set. We objected to delaying the rulemaking process for social study standards. This was not included the, as passed earlier, and we're pleased with that. The rulemaking will continue. And be assured, the teaching, the importance, and never forgetting the Holocaust will continue to be a part of what students learn in history, among other things. But this rule-making process will continue. We opposed last time the discrimination against transgender girls in athletics. This was not included. Of course, there were items that uh, we had advocated that didn't make it, and there, that's always going to be the case. I'll just mention a couple that we will continue to work on. The need for full service community schools, proven that you close the achievement gap when you provide wraparound services for students and families at an early age, they're ready for K when you can do that. How much easier will it be for a teacher and staff, support staff team, if a student is ready for school that day? 
with uh, not all the other potential issues that need to be addressed. Full service community schools, we'll continue to advocate that. And additional funds in the early education partnerships. We, there is funding for the great program for NAS uh, in North, Northeast Minneapolis, for the Promise program in St. Paul, the uh, programs in early education partnerships in St. Cloud, which Sandra Putnam told us about, but also Northfield and Red Wing and Austin. And may this continue the funds. I believe they have to apply for grants for about a half a million dollars. But this makes a difference, these early education programs. And so when we talk about what works, this works, and there's bipartisan support. But again, it takes resources to do it. OK, $21 billion. And uh, it'll start going out before too long in increments to schools, charter schools, others, actually non-public, get some of that too, through uh, non-religious type services. And the challenge for us now is to listen. When people ask, what, what's your job? And I focus, I just say four things. Listen, look, learn, and lead. And that's what we need to do in all aspects of our work. Board. But for those of us passionate on education, Visit your schools. Thank the teachers. Thank the support staff who have gone through incredible sacrifices, the backbone of that team. And I believe the tax bill is going to have some good news as to uh, the role that the uh, support, educational support personnel have provided for some additional funding. But we need to get out and listen. I, we talked about mandates and that we should avoid mandates. You know, there are mandates in here, and I support them. You know what many of them relate to? Special education. And some 13, 14 or so percent of Minnesota's nearly uh, will round it, one million students. But the parents are advocates, and they do have some mandates regarding reports and intervention. In the past, too, we've talked about mandates related to dyslexia, which you have championed, Senator Chamberlain. And, we, and I've supported, I support those efforts that parents have asked for. Uh, there was a mandate that Senator Coleman had that I supported regarding our world's best workforce and looking at the ninth grade, the critical time in ninth grade, and in terms of the information as to whether a student could be very high at risk of not graduating and if we don't uh, intervene. And we asked for more information there, but it didn't make it. But uh, there are mandates that parents ask. And remember, when we approve $21 billion, you know, we aren't a benevolent foundation. We ask for results. It's part of our duty. So I hope we continue to reach out to the schools. I hope we can have some interim hearings not next month, but thereafter. And maybe we can do some joint things with other committees, like with Senator Abler's committee. The omnibus bill that we addressed that Senator Benson, Senator Abler, Hoffman you know, presented had a number of things on child care and addressing the achievement gap, high quality early ed programs, and the nexus, the intersection is clear. So, and I want, I re remember how passionate Senator Rolf was on this issue and the early education and working on this. So I would invite that and I'm quite sure Senator Wickland and we could work with our colleagues 
in the House as well. That's good, because it's been a long time since we've had an interim type hearing, and the challenges are there. So that's a challenge, and I want to remind everyone again, when you worked so hard and then took the oath of office to uphold the Constitution, we have Article 13, Section 1. And it's a duty for a uniform system of public schools for us to establish a general and uniform system and then provisions regarding the funding. We aren't there yet. It's in the Constitution. And so let's continue to have those discussions. And going back to Governor Walls, I know there was some criticism by uh, Republicans as to how much money was being recommended, but they seem pretty, pretty happy now about the amount of money in the formula, but there's a, pro a proposal, a transformational proposal called Do North, and every child getting equal education with equity regardless of zip code. There's a number of strategies. There's also been a study on school funding with a great deal of participation. And this should not gather dust, it should gather momentum. That is our charge. Members, it's our duty. We need to do it. It's in our state's best interest. Students are our future. Vote green. Thank you. Further discussion on House file to Senator Rood. Thank you, Mr. President. I want to thank Senator Chamberlain for having the courage and the fortitude to hear Senate File 96, Save Women's Sports, and for including it in the omnibus bill. And I'm sorry, but I'm not surprised that it wasn't included in the, in the final bill, because I'll be very honest with you, it really wasn't ready. In this era of Zoom calls and not being able to meet in person, I don't think that we really gave it the opportunity to have the vetting that it really needed to pass this body. And so uh, it's very personal for me um, I've lived through the whole era of not having women's sports and the 50 years of Title IX, and I've seen the amazing progress made by women, and I'm pretty proud of that. When I started this legislation, we were kind of on the cutting edge. We were one of nine states who brought this legislation forward, and now there's 37 states that are addressing this issue. Many have passed bills, many have made task force, but they're all addressing this issue. And I'm working with a group, it's called Save Women's Sports, and it's a nonpartisan grassroots um, organization of women across the United States. And it started right here in Minnesota. You know, um, I have on my desk, I, I listen to the tapes and I listen to the committee hearing and I listened to all the hurtful, harmful comments, and I was going to stand up here and really give you a hellfire and brimstone for all the things that were said. Um, but I don't think that solves anything. And so I will tell you that never in my 13 years in the Senate has my motivation on an issue ever been questioned. And yet, three times that day on this very floor, my motivation was questioned to the point that the state that the president had to step in three different times to stop it. That's not how we work in this Senate. That's not who we are. So this issue is not going away. And it's, it's, a, it's a national dialogue, but I will tell you with the 2020 Olympics, it's a global dialogue. And it's a conversation that we need to have right here in Minnesota. And it's been stated that this is hurtful to transgender youth. And I will tell you the hurtfulness is not addressing this problem in Minnesota. The more, the more we wait, the more harm, harmful it is. 
You know, I've been asked to attend a conference in Washington State this summer, and it's called Sovereign Women Speak. And it's a conference for sovereign women across the nation to come and talk about how this is devastating their community. And I have committed to really learning more about this issue and to really take it to heart. So I'm asking you all this. While we're in the interim, let's all put away our preconceived ideas about what this is and what it is not. Put it in your back pocket. And let's listen to this national and global dialogue about this issue. And I, I ask you to come back next session. And let's address this issue with the per professional and dignified way that it, in the tradition of this Senate, with the kindness in our heart to have the tough conversations that we need to resolve this. You know, through the years, I look around this chamber, and I have worked with so very many of you on tough issues, tough conversations, conversations we may not wanted to have, but they were needed to have to solve an issue. And so members, Senate File 96 was not ready for prime time this year, and I appreciate that Senator Chamberlain gave us the opportunity to start the conversation, and I look forward to next session to sitting down with many of you and having the dialogue that needs to happen to solve this so that women can be uh, uplifted and, and um, compete in their sports and our transgender youth can feel the worthiness and they can also have a, a place to compete. And so I, I thank you members for the conversations and I hope look forward to working with you in the next session. Final discussion on House File 2, Senator Swazinski. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I have four things, observations about the bill that I'm enthusiastically supporting, and then one request. Colleagues, um, over the last 16, 18 months, it's kind of a blur, but whenever I would talk to my former colleagues or constituents that are currently in the classroom, and I'd say to them, how was your year? Or how's it going? Or how is your year? The things they would say, I can't say on the floor of the Senate. But you guys know, you guys talk to your teachers and your, and your friends that are in the classroom and the bus drivers and the paras and the lunchroom line ladies and gentlemen and, and the teachers. And, and they, they had a rough year, as many of us did. And um, so I went to a friend of mine's retirement party uh, about three weeks ago. And after 38 years of teaching, a bunch of his friends were there, a bunch of us, and there was a young woman we hired in Eden Prairie about 20 years ago, and I think of her often, because she loved teaching. It was her calling. It was her passion. She was among the most enthusiastic and exuberant young people we've ever hired in Eden Prairie. And every summer, she would fill her summer with workshops and retreats and seminars and, and ways to make her teaching even better. And she would come in, the, in the, the department with smiles. And she just loved, she was so grateful to the powers that be that she got to spend time with kids. And so I went, when I went to this retirement party, I knew she would be there. And I wanted to ask her, how was your year? Because I knew she would be a breath of fresh air. I knew she would be the silver lining. I knew she would be the one that would tell me, Swat, it was an amazing year. I, I had all these experiments and insights into our species. And so I went up to her, and she said, Swat, I almost came this close to quitting in March. And it was devastating to me. Because I thought of all the teachers I knew in their classroom, she would be the one that would find meaning in COVID. So when I saw this bill, I thought right away to all the counselors and secretaries and security people and bus drivers and paras and, and, and lunchroom people and, and the school nurses and the social workers and yes, the teachers, 2.45% and 2% on the funding formula is our way of saying to them, thank you. Thank you for enduring. Thanks for not giving up. Thanks for being there for our kids. 
day in and day out. It almost brought a tear to my eye when I saw that on the funding formula that we said to educators throughout this state, thank you. My second thing I'd like to say about this bill, in my 33 years, I never once had any training on how to recognize signs of suicidal thoughts in my students. I never once had a seminar or a workshop or a retreat or a counselor moment so here's what you want to look for. Here's what kids will think or say or do or write about when they're thinking about suicide. And when I saw in this bill a few hundred thousand dollars to help our teachers, help our students recognize maybe in their thinking or their writing that they're contemplating taking their life, it brought a tear to my eye. Because the only thing I can think of worse in my teaching career than staring at those empty desks that were once filled with a child who chose to end their life is the parents that have to look at that empty chair across the dinner table for the rest of their lives. And I think this bill, if it saves one kid, if one teacher in this state saves one kid because of this bill, I applaud all of you for getting that measure in this bill. Thirdly, as, has, as Senator Chamberlain brought up, we are becoming um, the digital addictions, if you will, that we are um, dealing with on a daily basis, the, the physical and social and mental and emotional and cognitive developments of our children are being stifled, stymied by their addictions with um, their digital devices. And so there's some good, bill, some good measures in this bill to reduce the misuse and overuse of screen time. In fact, on line 16.1 of the bill, check it out, colleagues, is the word nomophobia. I think you're going to hear a lot more in the coming months about this word nomophobia because I think some of us here, including myself, at times suffer from it. Fourthly, and most importantly, and the fourth one that brought a tear to my eye when I saw the final bill. When I came here this session, the number one thing I wanted to work on was getting more teachers of color into our classrooms. I worked with about 40 to 50 social studies teachers during my teaching career. They came and went through our department. There was one teacher of color. The teaching of social studies, of our society. And we had one out of 40 to 50 that looked not like me. And there's $16 million, depending on how you count the math, in this bill for Grow Your Own programs, and intro to teaching programs, and other ideas that many members in this chamber and our constituents and lobbyists and stakeholders came up with in the last session to get more teachers of color into our classrooms. I know it's just a baby step, but that baby step is going to prove huge in the coming decades because there's nothing sadder to me than going up to a 12th grader, student of color, and saying, hey, have you thought about going into teaching? And they'd look at me like, what? No, I never thought about that. And part of me thought the reason they never thought about it because they never had a teacher that looked like them in third grade. They never had a teacher that looked like them in seventh grade. They never had a teacher that looked like them in 11th grade. So they had no idea that that was an option to them. Teachers of color bills and things we're doing in this bill are going to make a huge difference in our achievement gap. One of the things I just want to share with my colleagues is Eden Prairie High School is one of the first school districts in the state to do an intro to teaching class. And I went and I spoke at it. And I heard the 20 kids after a semester of this class intro to teaching. And they all talked about now whether or not they were going to be a teacher. And my favorite comment by a kid says, I wanted to be a teacher until this class, but I don't want to have to work this hard. I want to thank Senator Chamberlain for using the word, the constitutional duty. 
Because Article 13 says this constitutional duty of ours. And I have a request, just like Senator Rood just did, for my colleagues in the interim. And I hope Senator Chamberlain and I can talk about this further. And I know it's important to him, money not mandates. He used that line, I do believe, three times. And it resonates, and it makes sense. But there is one mandate that I want to bring up ad nauseum, because you know what's coming. But there is a phrase right outside this wall, up on the top, on the, on the, uh, a quote in stone, engraved forever on the walls of the Minnesota State Capitol. And it says, eternal good citizenship. Eternal good citizenship. Let that soak in. Eternal good citizenship is the price of good government. Good government would require 11th and 12th graders to take a class in civics. So if there's one thing missing in this bill, I hope when you go this summer to your town halls and your county fairs and your parades and your coffee with your senator, I ask you to just ask your constituents, you, do you believe we should be teaching government and civics to 11th and 12th graders? Because I believe those people will look at you and go, we don't? What do you mean it's not required? And I'd, I'd be so honored if some of you in the coming months give me a call, send me an email, work with me, because I'd love and be honored to work with you as we move forward to bring those words on that stone into this chamber. Eternal good citizenship is the price of good government. Thank you, Mr. President. Final discussion on the bill, Senator Newman. Mr. President, uh, thank you. I'll, I'll try to be uh, succinct. Uh, I, I did want to tease Senator Weger uh, just a bit, Mr. President, uh, with his fictional A100 delete all. Uh, you almost cost us the chair of the Senate uh, Education Committee. I thought he was going to have a heart attack. I simply wanted to, to uh, stand up and, and uh, indicate to the body that this was my first year on education. Uh, by trade, I am not an educator, so I chose to do a lot of listening uh, instead of talking, and you would be surprised what you learn uh, when you're not talking. So I spent a lot of time listening uh, to uh, Senator Chamberlain as he led the Education Committee this year. And what I gleaned from this is that I believe that Senator Chamberlain recognizes some of the problems that we are facing in our education uh, in the state of Minnesota. Things like graduation rates, literacy. Uh, he recognizes the need for some reforms. And if you look at his bill, uh, you've got a handout from him, uh, 2021 legislative first special session. Just look at uh, lines uh, 25 under teacher, uh, teachers and line 15 under education excellence. Uh, Roger Chamberlain led us down that path. And he listened to his committee members, and he listened to the bills, and he listened to the people who came into the, uh, into the Zoom meetings with us as to what those folks had to say as to what was needed uh, in education. So I, I simply wanted to, to say that I think Senator Chamberlain, uh, as the chair of education, was in fact a leader. He is leading us in the right direction. He recognizes the need for the reform. And uh, I just want to congratulate him. Uh, I think that this truly is a very good bill. I think it's going to garner a lot of bipartisan support. And uh, I simply want to say to Senator Ch uh, Chamberlain, uh, good job, well done. Thank you, Mr. President. Final discussion on the bill, Senator Marty. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I want to second a couple of the comments Senator Weger made. I have not served on Education Committee, and so I'll be fairly brief. But I know Senator Chamberlain talks a lot about, I keep hearing the phrase, money, not mandates. Well, his original bill that he brought before the Senate a couple months ago 
couple weeks ago, I saw it as mandates, not money. And I see there, I mean, obviously there are still mandates in here that aren't properly perhaps funded. The district's requiring to use their 2% staff development for mentoring programs, which is a good thing. I like to see that, but again, other staff development things get pushed aside for that. But the whole theme of the original bill, the bill he presented a couple weeks ago, which I had to oppose, was in effect a mandates not money bill. It came in about $152 million, which was $350 million below inflation. Inflation alone for this biennium would hit the schools, cost them $518 million, and we were providing only, in Senator Chamberlain's bill, only $150 million. The reason for saying that is that things have really gotten better in this. I'm proud to support this bill, and I think from the Funding that Senator Chamberlain had in his original bill, the $150 million, once it got through Governor Walls' input and the House DFL's input and some of our folks here, Senator Weger and Senator Kunish and Senator Isaacson and Senator Wickland and others who care about this, pushing for more funding, the money for the, next, for the current upcoming biennium is a full $400 million more. It's more than three times what came in in the Chamberlain bill. So for those of us who saw the original bill of Senator Chamberlain as mandates, not money, this is a huge improvement. And this one is, I think it's the first time in several years that we've, we've at least met the inflation level. Inflation hit schools by 518 million and this bill provides 554. So I wanna thank all those who helped push it up because going from 152 million to 554 is a huge, more than tripling increase, and I think it's wonderful, and I think our schools will benefit from it, and as one who believes our schools need money, I think this is a big step forward, and I'm proud to support the bill, and thank Senator Weger and Governor Walls and others who pushed so hard to make that happen. Final discussion on the bill, Senator Duckworth. Uh, thank you, Mr. President, and uh, I don't think I'm going to necessarily be able to, to match the passion of Senator Swiger and Senator Swazinski. They do a phenomenal job. They obviously very, uh, care very deeply and passionately about our schools, our kids, our teachers, and that's something I respect about both of them. So please don't mistake my, uh, my lack of display of outward passion for not caring because I care very deeply about this topic, uh, about our public schools and our kids. And uh, I want to echo the sentiments that were shared not that long ago. And I do want to thank our teachers and staff for enduring really two school years that have been remarkable in many ways. But I also want to thank our kids and our families for enduring what they had to endure over that same period of time, the very people that we exist to serve when it comes to our public schools. And I don't mean to sound somber. I'm very excited uh, as a former school board member about this bill and about the increase to the formula and the impact that's going to have on our schools. But we have to take a step back and honestly assess where we are from the perspective of the boots on the ground, that being our kids, their parents, teachers, principals, superintendents, and school boards, because let's be honest, their work is just beginning. And if we're being really honest, it never really stopped over the course of the last two years and all the different changes that they had to endure and work through. Where we go from here is critical. Our schools hobbled across the finish line this school year, and that's not a criticism. That's just acknowledging reality. As you heard, it was tough for everybody, teachers, staff, kids, families included. And as we prepare to start this next upcoming school year, our kids, their education, and well-being need to be priority number one. We owe it to them to be honest about where our kids are and provide them the help and the resources they critically need now more than ever. I absolutely love 
our public schools. I want them to succeed because that means our kids are succeeding, which means our communities are succeeding. But we're kidding ourselves if we don't acknowledge the work that has to be done to re-enhance the relationship between our schools, kids, and their parents in many cases. And that's something that we need to run to, not away from. Our kids, their education and well-being need to be at the forefront of our decision-making as we move forward. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Putnam. Thanks, Mr. President. Uh, you know, uh, I want to rise just initially just to thank Senator Weaker and all of those who worked so hard to stand up uh, to and in this bill to foreground our students, our parents, and our teachers, and who did so with knowledge of the experiences that they were having and a commitment to making their work and their professional lives and their moral obligations more fulfilling and more profound. Um, the original bill that left this house, that left this body, uh, it wasn't good. Uh, to be candid. It, it was troubling and problematic in a number of ways. Uh, and I know that it was clearly more of a, a bargaining position than an actual statement of principles and policy. But I do think we need to remember that were that bill to have passed, it would have actively harmed students, parents, and teachers in the state of Minnesota. You know, with a 0% increase in the budget formula, that's $3 million fewer dollars in the St. Cloud Public School District to pay for teachers, paras, and all the things that we need. And it's not like we were swimming in money before. Uh, our class sizes are way too big. And without that investment, they would have gotten even bigger. So I'm incredibly grateful to those of us uh, in this body and in the other and to the, some of the leadership of the governor to actually do, make this build better. Now, the process was not as transparent as one might hope. But I got to admit, it kind of worked. Because the thing that we have before us today is actively pretty good. Uh, and I do hope that we support it. But there is one point that I'd like to make, uh, forwarding something that's suggested by Senator Weger earlier today. And I don't like to be that guy who's like, well, you know, the bill is all right, but there's all these things that aren't in it. And then we complain about what's not in it. And we don't acknowledge what actually is. I'm not trying to be that guy. But what I'm going to say is that we talk so much about innovation in education. And we had a great opportunity to do exactly that by investing more in the Educational Partnerships Coalition. That is an innovative program that has a disproportionately positive effect on greater Minnesota where I live. And the thing that's most important about it is that it establishes relationships between the schools and the community. At Partners for Student Success, the United Way of Central Minnesota, that's a, a group of people who are dedicated to providing auxiliary help to our public schools through philanthropy, through relationships with businesses, through relationships with the community more generally, with nonprofits, and they leverage the resources that we give them into having a legitimate and profound impact on the actual lives of students every single day. So I encourage us, as we look forward to future education funding, to look at opportunities like that, that have that profound impact. You may remember I told a story on the floor a couple months ago about Nora. Now, if you guys want to be here until 2 o'clock in the morning again, I can tell you lots more stories about the good things that have been done by the Educational Partnership Coalitions. But I don't think we do. So next time when we talk about education, let's truly think about innovation. Look at things that are already working and support those programs as best as we can. You know, my daughter, when she was a freshman in high school, was one of 40 kids in her English class. In a freshman English class, 40 kids. She had to share a desk with her teacher. She's a nerd, so that worked out OK. But still, think of all the things that are being missed in that classroom when you have a ratio of teachers to students like that. Well, educational partnerships, they bring other people into the, the classroom to be able to check in with all the kids in the classroom to be able to help them live their lives and do their work and succeed. So colleagues, I implore you, next time we talk about funding education, can we think a little bit harder about truly standing up for the Educational Partnerships Coalitions and supporting them so that they can do the work that we know that they can do so well? Senator Kunish. 
Thank you and good morning, everybody. Um, I'm very pleased to stand up and speak to um, some of the good things that are in this bill. But I think what's really important is that we recognize the significant um, struggle this past year has presented, not just for our uh, legislature here, but for our families, our communities, and our schools. I just retired from uh, teaching after 25 years this past November. For the last four years as a legislator, I would start out my school year as a library media specialist in a middle school, get them all set up, and get, make sure that students had the technology in the hands that they needed, that the programs and the, the um, equipment was there for teachers and staff to ensure that there is a good school year for our students, and then I'd come to the legislature. And fortunately, I was in the education uh, committees for those four years uh, in the House, and I learned so much. I learned a whole different uh, view of education coming from the legislative side of it. One of the reasons I decided to run for um, a, a legislative seat is to ensure that we are funding our students, that we are putting the resources and the tools in the hands of our administration, our teachers, and our students and families to ensure that we are giving them a very good quality education. And I believe Minnesota Minnesota does. And I don't believe that the, the struggles that we are having is, is necessarily on the shoulders of our teachers. It's the fact that we have never fully funded our schools, and so this formula that is going forward this year makes me very, very happy because I remember the first three years of my teaching career until I got tenured. Every year I got that pink slip. And every year I would go into a panic because I was a single mom. What am I going to do? Now I have to go out and find another job. And fortunately, the legislator, legislature would come through and my principal would say, uh, ha ha, once again, we want you back. And so this is the kind of thing that our teachers go through every spring. And it's unfortunate for the teachers and for our administration to have to wait for the legislature to fund our schools. It has to be a priority. And one of our priorities is, is to ensure that we are supporting our teachers, not only through the, um, the salaries that they make and the benefits that they have, but also to ensure that resources are there and that we are building the kind of community of educators that we can be even more proud of in Minnesota. And so I am so pleased to see all the different fundings for teachers of color and the different support systems in this bill. Um, as, a, as a new teacher, I was first in the sixth grade classroom in North Minneapolis. And it was, um, it was a school that, that was more diverse, not just by student, but by teachers and, and administration as well. By the time I finished my fifth year in that school, I was the only light-colored, white-looking person in my classroom. It was that diverse. And we had teachers from every walk of life, from every culture that you can imagine, as well as those students. It felt like a mini United Nations. And so I am so, so very happy to see the efforts that we are putting forward to encourage to grow our own teachers. When I see a, a, a teaching assistant that I know would make a wonderful teacher, that connects to the students, that has the same life experiences that they have, that speak their language or understand their cultural uniqueness, those are the people we want to bring into our teaching profession. And you've heard it a million times. When a kid sees somebody that looks like them, speaks like them, um, has those same life experiences, not only are they going to excel, but the rest of the staff is going to. So I'm really super encouraged to see that, that that's there. Teaching is a hard job. It's not easy. And unfortunately, while we might have, um, have a number of teachers in our, our, our state, uh, who are not teaching, in fact, um, one of the statistics is that slightly more than half, or 52.5% of the teachers holding an active teaching license here in Minnesota are not currently working as a teacher in our public schools. And you have to wonder why. 
I think Senator Putin, Putnam um, uh, mentioned the, the class ratio, the size of the teachers, or the classroom to a uh, teacher. When I first started teaching, the state legislature had a mandated um, class limit. And I remember how great that was because you actually could build those relationships with your students. You could see when something was not right. You could tell when, when there was a, a, a pencil that they didn't have or uh, a tennis shoes that they didn't have for gym, and you could help that kid succeed. And so I really appreciate the mentoring um, part of this bill. There was a woman at that school that I taught at. Uh, her name was Dolores Riley, and she was my mentor. She was a seasoned uh, teacher, African-American woman from the community, and I learned so much from her. It was the base of her, her help and her mentorship that made me the kind of teacher that I was. And to this day, I am eternally grateful. Those are the kind of, of, of resources we want to make sure we have in our schools. And uh, I will continue to work hard. And so I'm glad to see some of the funding going towards these, these issues. Uh, one area that I'd like to see more uh, emphasis in and resources going to are our library systems, our library media specialists in our schools. So many of the schools have let those go with the lack of funding that, um, over the last 10 years. And library media specialists play an incredible role. We know every kid in our school. We know which books they like, which books they don't like. We know when their computers aren't working. We know when they're playing games on their computers and should be working because we hear it firsthand. Last year at this time, I was scrambling um, to get back to my school to help make sure that all of our students had a, a Chromebook to take home for the summer. And then in the fall, I was there to ensure that we got those Chromebooks back, 900 Chromebooks back, to pass down to the third graders so that they could take them home for a year of distance learning. And then issue out a whole new set of Chromebooks to those students. Those are the kind of responsibilities we have in our libraries, in our schools. It's not just books and literacy, which is so, so very important, but it's the kind of responsibility uh, around uh, digital well-being, as is in this uh, bill as well, literacy, making sure that we have the kind of books, the kind of resources, and the research available for our students to make sure that they are 21st century learners. And so uh, just to end my, my tirade, because I could go on, uh, I really do want to thank the teachers who pivoted on a dime to create an online learning environment that they had never, ever imagined. And I saw how hard those teachers worked, not only to learn the new programs and the new systems, but to ensure that they continue to have those relationships with their students. If a student didn't show up one day, a teacher knew, could see that. When a student didn't show up online a second day or a third day, there were alarm bells that went off. And I know so many teachers that went into a panic when a student didn't show up online, worrying, did they have internet service? Is their, their computer working? Um, is their family uh, in, in some kind of a, a crisis? What is it? And reaching out, not just by telephone or by emailing, but actually going to homes to ensure that those kids and those families are safe and have the resources that they need. I want to thank all the teacher's assistants who continue to stay in the buildings from when COVID started all the way through. When I returned to my school in the fall, it was the staff in the office, it was the custodians, it was the media specialists and the assistants who were running the show from the school. And I want to thank them so much. I want to make sure to thank the food service providers, the custodians who worked so hard to keep our schools clean and safe uh, for all of us, the counselors who went be up above and beyond to ensure that those students who apparently were really struggling had the services that they needed. Our EL students, I mean, 
If I had um, an issue or if there was a problem with a family who didn't speak English well, I knew I could count on my EL students to reach out to that family and actually bring, uh, bring me together with that student and with their family to walk them through the processes on their computers that they were really struggling with. And I really want to thank the families and the parents that changed their lives to make sure that their students' education was not interrupted. This past fall, I sat on the phone for eight, 10 hours a day, helping students, helping families get through the initial uh, beginning of the school year online. And there was one grandma that would call every single day. Every day she would call me and she would say, how do you do this? How do I get that? Call her grandson over and tell him to sit down and do, walk through those steps. She was the one that got him up and running and made sure that he was getting the, the resources and those educational skills that he needed to succeed. And then one day she didn't call, and I really missed it. And the next day, she didn't call. And I was just like, again, in a panic, like, what is going on? And the third day, she didn't call. And I called home to her house, and I just said, I want to make sure you're OK. I haven't heard from you in three days. And she's like, oh, Miss KP, we don't need you anymore. We got this now. And that's when I knew that she was going to be OK, that her grandson was going to have a good school year. And so with all of those people uh, working so hard for our schools and all the legislators in the House and here in the Senate working so hard to make sure that our students are going to succeed, I'm just really looking forward to, to a, um, a good bill here that's going to address some of those issues and look forward to the future when we can really create a, a wonderful first class learning system for our students and for our state. Senator Port. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I want to join my colleagues in really heartfelt gratitude and thanks to our teachers, the support staff, the paras, um, who really have invested so much of themselves this last year in creating and supporting our students, our families, bringing a level of stability and caring to our communities throughout the state in a really uncertain year. Um, Giving our kids a safe, stable place and way to learn, to grow, to find themselves, to figure out the adults they're going to grow into is just really a vital part of how our society works. And our kids, they hear us. They hear their parents. They hear teachers. And yes, they even sometimes hear their legislators. And to that end, I want to say to the trans youth out there that we see you, we hear you, you belong here, you have a place here, and though it's clear that the fight for trans rights is not over, you can know that we've got your back. Next is Senator Pratt. Thank you, uh, Mr. President and members. Um, I really want to stand up and thank Senator Chamberlain for what really is the best education bill I've seen come across the Senate floor in my time here. And having chaired an education committee, I guess that says a lot because I thought my bill was pretty good. Um, what I really want to say is, having served on a school board for 12 years, we know that uh, stable, reliable. Well, let me let me take a step back, Mr. President. I want to thank Senator Chamberlain because this is a bill that focuses on the needs of students. It puts the needs of students first. It focuses on student achievement. It focuses on making sure we have great teachers in the classroom. It makes sure we have stable and reliable funding for our public schools. I support public schools. 
Senator Chamberlain, with this funding, assures that our schools coming out of a really tough year and a half can recover. He puts the focus on students by making sure they have the resources necessary to continue their education and recover from a lost year of learning, but also, also to stop the mandates that would distract our staff, putting those mandates and those standards on hold for two years. Senator Chamberlain has been a tireless advocate for literacy. I served on the Education Committee with him for several years, and literacy was his passion. He knew that literacy was the key to students graduating and becoming successful. And so we have the investment in literacy training for our teachers to make sure our students can be successful because we also know that the number one predictor for a student is whether or not they're reading at grade level by third grade. He knows that it takes a great teacher in the classroom and I appreciate the focus on recruiting and retaining teachers of color. Mr. President, I, you know, I was proud to work with Senator Claussen on the teacher licensure reform bill a few years ago and we put some provisions in for teachers of color. This takes it a step further. So Mr. President, I again want to thank Senator Chamberlain for putting students first in this bill, for focusing on student achievement. And there are things I wish that were in this bill that I think would have helped close the achievement gap, but I'm going to proudly vote yes for this bill because I think this is probably the best bill we've seen in 15 years. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Isaacson. Thank you, Mr. President. <clears throat> so. I I'm, hate to sound like a broken record of the, what has already been said, but I, I want to take a moment to uh, thank, personally, uh, the teachers that I interacted with while my children were doing distance learning, and the teachers all over the state that reacted literally overnight to change the way we educated to make it the best possible situation for our students in a place they weren't trained to do, creating a curriculum and a pedagogical shift that was different than we might expect to try to create a system that limits the harm of what COVID brought to the table as much as possible. And I think those teachers are the reason why we're going to get through this year and, and find our way back on track. I also want to thank the kids and the parents. Uh, as a person who had kids in that system, having to adjust to a new reality is difficult and the parents that had to make do. And I would say that the education rate on a lot of basic things went up among our parents for all the things they had to learn and then teach back to their kids. I learned some new math things that they're learning in first grade that I didn't know existed and didn't exist when I was in, when I was in elementary school. So uh, I want to thank those kids and parents for persevering because the true champions here are the teachers, kids, and parents. That team is what makes this work. That team is why we're going to get better and grow and become stronger. And that is exactly where any of the credit is, is, should belong, teachers, kids, and parents. I want to thank Chair Dabney and Governor Walls for making this bill so much better than it was when it left here. Uh, it's unbelievable the difference that it makes uh, and the work that they did to make this a better situation for our students. Uh, but I want to be clear, despite what I think was near heroic work by Chair Dabney and the Governor's office, Let's be, let's be real here, folks. This is just a slightly nicer Band-Aid than we usually put on this situation. We did a couple of nice things in here that are good, but this is just a nicer Band-Aid. This doesn't solve the problem, right? And so as much as I'd love to see a victory lap for having really taken a shot at changing the culture and many of the systemic problems we have in our education system, what we really did is allowed it so we can make it a couple more years and hope that we do it the next time right, the right way. We are not doing right by our students because we are not doing right by our teachers and we're not doing right by our schools. What our responsibility is. If you've heard anything I've said over the last eight years that I've been here, the reason Minnesota is so amazing 
on almost every rubric you can imagine except for one very important one, which has to do with racial equity, is where we educate our people. And as long as we continue to not invest the way we should or need to, to match where the costs are and the needs are of an incredibly complex system of education, trying to meet the needs of a growing and ever-changing economy and social world, we're going to continue to see problems. Am I glad there's two and two and a half on the formula? Certainly I am. That is by far a bigger and nicer Band-Aid than I anticipated us getting this time, and I'm grateful for that, right? And I'm grateful we could come together and get that done. But we still haven't acknowledged or really made a clear understanding of what changes actually need to occur in our education system to make it better. And I don't know if that's gridlock or a lack of political will, but there's a lot we still need to do. And we left a ton of stuff on the table that I wish we would be willing to take up. And I know the political will to get that done isn't there yet, but I'm hoping as we go that we'll evolve and get there. So folks, I am moderately pleased that we have a better Band-Aid than I thought we'd have at the end of this session. I'm moderately pleased that we've taken some important steps on equity, but I'm disappointed that it still falls far short of where I hope we'd end up and what I know we need to do. And I'm committed to those heroes I talked about, the kids, the teachers, and the parents, to give them everything they need to be successful in our public education system. I'm committed to that now, and will be continue to be committed to that through, as long as I serve in the Senate, to be that voice and make sure that we understand they've got to be our priority. Because when we take care of them, a lot of the other things we're worried about in our society gets managed. So thank you very much. Final discussion on the bill, Senator Nelson. Thank you, Mr. President. I rise in support of House File 2. I commend and thank Senator Chamberlain for his leadership on this education bill at this most critical time when our students and our schools have been stressed the most that we could ever imagine uh, that our public schools, that all of our schools would be stressed during the pandemic, the shutdowns, the hybrid learning, the in-person learning, and the back and forth between those things. And we really do, we really must salute all who stood strong with our kids during this time. Parents made great adjustments. Teachers made great adjustments. Our schools made great adjustments. Employers had to adjust accordingly. And there's a couple things that we've learned. We've learned how important education is. We should have known all along, many of us do, education is the great equalizer, and it is our future. And had anyone doubted that before the pandemic, they know now. It is critical that our kids are well prepared and the bill before us that Senator Chamberlain has championed through to today has done that. He talks about simple. It is simple. And it focuses on students, and he continues, this bipartisan agreement continues to fund what works. I'm just going to name a few things that are standouts. Certainly, Continuing and expanding the Teachers of Color Act is a significant growth point in this bill. Things like expanding Grow Your Own, the Reach and Retain grants, these are going to impact our students going forward. Senator Chamberlain and the House, as they came together on this bipartisan compromise, focused on students equally, increasing funding on the per-pupil formula. It has increased year after year, far exceeding inflationary costs. I'm glad to see additional funds put on the per-pupil formula this year and particularly on that area where we see some of our greatest disparities, and that is in our English language learners. There is additional funding uh, to support our English language learners and, of course, special education costs as well. Those are good investments, members. 
And the one area that I would talk about where there's great excitement but also a little remorse is early learning. If we want kids to do well in school, they've got to be ready when they get to kindergarten. They have to be kindergarten ready. And as Senator Chamberlain has continued to focus on early literacy, we know that these kids need to read well at the end of third grade. And if they're not, they're going to struggle. And this bill focuses on early literacy, particularly on the highly successful letters training. I am glad to see that. We should all rejoice in that. There are two things that give me pause. One of them is the funding for the Educational Partnership Coalitions. Those are significant. They have made great progress in preparing kids, empowering their families to be successful. There is base funding. I'm glad to see that base funding has continued for our Educational Partnership Coalitions, things like Cradle to Career in Rochester, Northfield Promise, Every Hand Joined in Red Wing, and also the uh, one through the United Way in St. Cloud. So there is base funding. I'm glad to see that there. We do hope that the good work that they have started will continue with those broad community partnerships that they have developed. But my biggest regret, members, about what's not in this bill is high quality early learning scholarships. Members, the federal government sent us $524 million for early learning and child care. And I want to remind those who have been here before and those new members about the Minnesota model that is so successful other states have modeled it around our nation. And that is targeted, quality, high, learn, high quality early learning scholarships with an equity focus preparing kids for kindergarten. They have succeeded dramatically. And we had a great opportunity this year to further fund all of those three and four year olds in those at risk categories. Those kids who uh, live in poverty. Kids who had other factors that put them at risk. We could have funded high quality, targeted early, early learning scholarships for every one of those three and four year olds with just a portion of the federal money that was sent to us. The fact that they're not in this education bill lies at the feet of one person. And it lies at the feet of our governor, who particularly said that those federal dollars were not eligible for high quality targeted early learning scholarships. And yet, members, those same federal dollars with those same federal guidelines and strings are being used in other states for high quality targeted early learning scholarships. I do believe that is a great missed opportunity before us. And that decision was not made in this Senate chamber, and it was not made in the House. It was made by our governor. I do hope that we will continue in the future to fund those things that work. And I do salute what Senator Chamberlain has done in this bill before us today. It does focus on students, early literacy, and he added some new things as well regarding digital well-being, a growing need. So I, I thank Senator Chamberlain. I look forward to a strong green vote. Thank you. Uh, final discussion on the bill, Senator Fate. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, first, I want to thank uh, Senator Chamberlain as well as uh, Senator Weger uh, for hearing and accepting um, our religious observance uh, holiday bill. Um, it will allow students and school districts to um, accommodate students uh, and respect uh, their religious beliefs and be absent from school on those holidays. So I want to thank Senator Weger and Senator Chamberlain for working with me on that, and that's something that we're all very proud of. Uh, that got included into the bill. Um, 
First, I want to start by saying uh, COVID this year has really hit uh, our students of color really hard this year, especially students in my district. Um, speaking to parents, we've seen uh, how remote learning has really impacted our kids. Uh, students in the fifth grade reading at a third grade level, students in the fourth grade reading at a second grade level. Um, it has been a really, really tough transition for all of us. And we're, uh, as we're going back uh, to normalcy, um, our goal should not be to go back to the way things were. We should go back and go back stronger. Uh, and uh, working towards uh, closing those equity gaps that we're seeing uh, in our schools. Our state has consistently been on the bottom of the list in the nation in uh, servicing our students of color. Um, one thing that, a couple of things that I'm proud of seeing in this bill was uh, the Teachers of Color Act, making sure that we're having, uh, uh, we're reaching out to folks to make sure that we have more teachers that look like uh, the students that they are teaching uh, in the classrooms. That is extremely important to me, ha being someone that uh, I think had one teacher that was a teacher of color in my entire K through 12 experience. Um, well, another thing I'm really proud of seeing is the increase in special needs, uh, special education funding. Um, having a sister uh, with special needs and, um, uh, and struggled uh, in the school system uh, being serviced. Um, this is something that I'm really proud of seeing because this is something that uh, I've connected with our community with a lot uh, and with our disability community uh, to make sure that uh, they're not forgotten. Uh, I really want to thank the teachers uh, for uh, working hard in this really, really tough year uh, and for the, for the patience of our parents uh, throughout this process. But I also want to thank uh, the, the business owners, the restaurants throughout the state uh, that have partnered with MDE uh, through uh, the Department, U.S. Department of Agriculture uh, with uh, after-school food programs to make sure that uh, our students do not go hungry. Um, it has been a, 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 a real success um, having our communities of color, our East African community, our Latino community, our indigenous brothers and sisters, um, the business owners participate in this program and be able to service the students that look like them and make sure that they don't go hungry. So I want to thank all of them as well. Uh, and uh, there's a lot of work that uh, needs to be done. Our schools are still not fully funded, but uh, I know that Senator Uyghur and Senator Chamberlain worked hard to make uh, to uh, make a compromise that uh, is in a step, a step in the right direction. So thank you. Final discussion on the bill, Senator Chamberlain. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, members. And we're always remiss if we don't do this. It's been a pleasure working on the K-12. It has been difficult over the years, but the staff, of course, we say it all the time, and I don't know how we make it more meaningful. Maybe we can get, well, I better not say that. <laughs> But they're, they're amazing. It's been a lot of fun working with Anne-Marie and Betsy and, and Jenna and, of course, our, our team as well. So it's been a real pleasure, and you learn a lot. And They're never stumped. They're never stumped. They always get it. They're just amazing. And thank you, members, for the comments, uh, both good and ill. But that is the nature of politics and the job we do here. Uh, I, it's wise to stop while you're ahead, as I am aware. I do have a couple final little thoughts to finish this out. So all, all session, and we can go back and look at tapes all over the place. Our mantra has, of course, been simple, as I mentioned earlier. But also that our job, my job, my focus, our focus, was not to focus on institutions and systems and buildings and we can find this. But to focus on the kids, my job, our job, was to focus and serve and represent the kids, the parents, and the educators, and not lobbyists, not buildings, not institutions, not systems. That's what some people have alluded to today. Some have not. <laughs> but um, that has been our mantra. That has been repeated many times this session in committee and out. And that is what we have striven to do, and that is what we have, I think, accomplished for the most part here. So we could have long discussions on all these issues, and I will just not get into that. We'll do that another day. There's another time for that. Um, reminder of a couple final things that 
in your journey, right, it doesn't really matter where you start. It's where you end. Not where you start, but where you end. And everybody in all walks of life start in particular points and spots, but where do they end? So just one last point on this number. We started at zero. We got to a, a, a spot we couldn't move. We went to three and one and a half. We went to three and one and a half in the Senate. The Senate position was three and one and 0.5 percent. It would have been 1.2 billion dollars. And that's where it sat for about two and a half weeks until we had to give up that money for other things. Now all these other things on these spreadsheets, that all takes money from the classroom, whether you like them or not, whether you like the outside programs or partnerships or whatever it is. That takes a dollar out of the classroom. We started at zero. We went to three and one and a half to give the educators and the schools what they asked for. Money, not mandates. The journey and where you end is where it's important. They ended up giving up some money, but we still had the largest increase in 15 years, but I would have liked to have seen it higher. Finally, you know, two final points. This trusts local educators, right? You put the money in their hands, they get to do what they want. Instead of going, taking the money and saying, you gotta do this with it, you gotta do that with it. That's what this is. And finally, I think most profoundly, this ties into our idea of simple. Members, there are times in life, it's the little things that matter. It's not the big sweeping things that always matter, but those little things that you do in life, those things you do for other people, do at work, that you think may not matter a whole lot in the beginning, but they grow to, as they say, from the mustard seed to something much bigger. And there are little things in this bill that I think will have significant impact, and I wish they would have been done earlier in this 10, 11 years. Little things will matter. And I think that's where we get at this bill. This is simple about students and innovation and no, few mandates, parents, literacy, efficiency, representing educators, parents, kids, and not those other systems and lobbyists. So that members, thank you for the discussion. And I will uh, end it there, thanks. Final discussion on the bill, Senator Gazelka. Mr. President, as we're looking at this bill, uh, and we, we look over this last year, without a doubt, the spotlight has been on education, and the question will be asked for a long time was the governor using emergency powers, working with the teachers union to keep kids out of the classroom for the length of time that were, they were out of the classroom? Was that a wise choice? I know many teachers wanted to be in the classroom. And we look back and we're going to look at the data and we can compare it to the parochial schools that had the kids in the, in the classroom. We can look to other states that had kids in the classroom or other countries that had kids in the classroom. And we're going to have to measure was that a good decision or not? I don't think so. But as we're moving forward to this bill and what do we do now, I think this bill does a lot. Before we get to that, I want to say a couple of disappointments that I have that are not in the bill. We continue to fight, Republicans continue to fight for more choices for the parents and their kids. Education savings accounts was what we were working on this year. Two years ago, it was opportunity scholarships. What I will tell you that the movement is growing. We did two press conferences this year with many uh, people from the communities of color to come in and say, look, we need other opportunities. Our kids are not getting the education they need. And we know it's true. And you heard uh, somebody on the floor here say that if we, if we go this route by 2025, it could be $250 million that is taken out of the public school system. Well, then you got to ask the question, well, why would that happen? Why would parents want to take their kids out of those schools and take other opportunities so that their kids can, su su can succeed? Why would they want to do that? And so we've got to look at this whole system, and we have to acknowledge that 
Some of the schools in Minneapolis and St. Paul are not getting the education that our kids need, and we've got to create an opportunity for them to have other choices. We have to think about that. If we think about what's in the best interest of the student and what's in the best interest of the parents that want to get their kids edu educated, then they need more options, and that will be something that we will never give up on, and someday we will accomplish that. The second one uh, Senator Rood talked about, is it fair that trans girls or biological ma males can play in girls' sports, biological girls' sports? And Senator Rood is making the case that we need to have a conversation about this. While we are concerned about the rights of the transgender community, what does it do to girls' sports and women's sports? And Senator Rood, being an a, a accomplished athlete, a champion, uh, can see what can happen to somebody and, and the awards and the, the feats that they've accomplished being biological females. So it is something we have to figure out how to navigate through. Uh, listen to Senator Rood. Let's have the conversation. Let's try to figure out a way through that. So those are two things that, uh, that didn't happen. Senator Weger talked about uh, the governor and the, the speaker and all Democrats. They're the ones that got this bill done. Well, first of all, the question is, why do we start low on some of these bills? Why, why do Republicans start low on, on every bill? Well, first, we see what the governor puts out, and the spending is so out of control that it requires massive taxes to do every time, every two years, no matter whether we have a surplus or don't have a surplus, big tax increases to cover big spending. And we're just saying we've got to live within the resources that we have. And as a result, uh, we, I think we have pretty good bills across the board, including a billion dollars of tax relief. So how did the deal go out? It was an offer from Republicans in the Senate that said, let's put a good uh, tax bill together with a good education bill, and that's what started the whole thing to finish. That's how we got to the number, but it's Senator Roger Chamberlain that fought to make sure the, the money on the formula was high and the mandates were low. That was Senator Roger Chamberlain all by himself fighting for three and one and a half. So across the state, if you think that that formula is good, no matter where you are in the state, if you think that that was great, big formula number, less mandates, you should thank Senator Roger Chamberlain because he's the one that recognized that that was the fairest way to do it across the board. In addition, we have a two-year delay on implementation of all of the standards. Some of us have expressed frustrations, and I heard again that somewhere in here that we would not take out the Holocaust. Well, that was conversation in some of these standards. Let's change the standards, not talk about George Washington, the Holocaust, World War, World War I, World War, World War II, all these different things that we're going to continue to have a conversation about is what should we be talking about, what should the standards be, but all of it, implementation is a two-year delay. Again, that's thanks to Roger Chamberlain. So no mandates. A two-year delay on some of, of these things that want to be implemented, really a good formula, and that's because of Roger Chamberlain. So uh, with that, I think we're done with that, Mr. President. At this point, I'll move that House File Number 2 be laid on the table until we wrap up a final discussion on the tax bill that's also coming. Senator Gazelka moves that we lay House File 2 on the table. All those in favor, say aye. Aye. Opposed, say no. Motion prevails. Remaining under motions and resolutions, uh, we have a Senate resolution to be read by the Secretary. Senators Kent, Gazelka and Kent introduce Senate Resolution Number 13, a Senate resolution amending the temporary rules of the Senate. Senator Gazelka. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I move Senate Resolution Number 13 be adopted. On that motion, Senator Gazelka. Uh, Mr. President, members, uh, this has to do with uh, how do we continue to function now that emergency powers have ended? What are we going to do about some of the things that were included as a result of that, uh, being able to vote remote, all of those things? And so what this does is it makes sure that we can meet, uh, the Rules Committee can continue to meet uh, in the interim, and if we ever have uh, a special sessions, things like that, the, the present way that we do it will remain until next January. 
between now and then, we all need to have a conversation about what do we want to do different. And I've asked Senator Kent as well uh, to be involved in this. How are we going to do this so that now that we have this new way of doing things, that we adopt the things that we should adopt, but also make sure that we're making sure that we protect some of the interests of the Senate, people being here, et cetera. So that's what this resolution is about, but all members should think about what do we do move going forward as, so as we get to next year's session, we've got a game plan. Discussion on the Gazelka motion to adopt Senate Resolution Number 13. Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed say no. Motion prevails. The resolution is adopted. We have another resolution to be read by the Secretary. Senator Zabler and friends, introduce Senate Resolution Number 14. Congratulations. Congratulating Daniel Burquist for earning the rank of Eagle Scout. Senate Resolution Number 14 will be referred to the Committee on Rules and Administration. Remaining under motions and resolutions. Senator Gazelka. Uh, Mr. President, I'll recess to the call of the President. Let's just say an hour. We just, there's just two little provisions that have to be worked out. Uh, to get the tax bill going. Uh, each day I tell you we're closer and closer, so we're closer. And Senator Gazelka, just for clarity, the, that bill will originate in the House and still go through that process and then come to the Senate. So um, it could very much, it could very well be longer than an hour, I'm just saying. Uh, <laughs> Senator Gazelka uh, uh, moves at the Senate recess to the call of the President. Uh, all those in favor say aye. Opposed say no. Motion prevails. The Senate is in recess.